Hello. In this short presentation, I want to talk about language change uh, with an emphasis on recognizing several common ways that languages change. The relevance of this topic uh, to the study of the history of English is no doubt pretty obvious. Um, in order to understand how English uh, has changed over the years, how it differs across different time periods and why, it helps to have a general framework of how linguistic changes occur. Before we get into some particulars, I want to stress a couple of general points. First, um, all living languages grow and change, right? So languages are like sharks in that sense that they always have to move forward or they die. So English is always in the process of change, um, even in this time when lots of people are prone to decrying changes, complaining about them, um, people who complain about how texting or uh, hip-hop or other things are destroying the English language. Um, even at, at this time, with those kinds of complaints being so prevalent, uh, I mean, other types of uh, attempts to prevent language change, to hold back changes, those complaints have very little effect on the actual process of change. Language change is constant and inevitable. Right. It's also worth noting that some changes may develop over centuries, while others take place in much shorter periods of time. Right? You can get a sense of this by thinking about some of the ways that you've experienced change in your own lifetime. Right? Think about how your, your parents and your grandparents talk and how that differs from the way that you talk. Right? Maybe you, you come from a family uh, where your grandparents or your parents said things like, wash the dishes, and you say, wash the dishes. Right? So that's just a very simple example of a change that might have happened in the last generation or two. Another key point, when we look at how languages change, we might ask which parts of language are subject to change. We're certainly aware that changes um, can happen in areas like vocabulary, right, where we're used to new words cropping up from time to time for various reasons. It's also the case that pronunciation changes, um, as do the meanings of words, right? Grammar, we might think is resistant here, but actually it too is subject to change. In fact, any element of language may change. Some components experience more rapid turnover, but everything in language can eventually change. When it comes to explaining why a language changed in some way, that answer depends on lots of individualized factors, not particular time, particular place, particular language structures. But it's useful to talk generally about patterns of change and to be able to categorize certain common types of change as a way of understanding how particular changes took place. Laying out some examples of this type is uh, what this presentation is, is designed to, to do. So let's look at some examples of language change. I'll just walk you through a few examples here. Let's start with this very simple example. Let's think about adjectives as we so often do. Um, and I give you some common uh, adjectives here, words like tolerant and operative and uh, humane. And if we think about those as, uh, uh, as words, what are the opposite, what are the antonyms for these adjectives? And of course, the simplest way of defining those is to think about words like instead of tolerant, the opposite is intolerant, operative, inoperative, humane, inhumane. So notice we have this prefix uh, in, I-N, uh, that is used to mean opposite or not. But what happens when we have that same process happen with words like possible or moral? Of course, in those instances, the opposite of those adjectives are impossible and immoral, right? So rather than an in, we have an im. And we might ask, why? Why is there an n? an alveolar sound in some words, but in the same prefix it has a bilabial, an M sound in other words. And the answer is probably rather obvious when you look at the words that take the M, you'll notice that both of them start with a bilabial consonant, an M in the case of moral and a, p, a bila voiceless bilabial stop in the case of possible. Right? And so you can see that we have a change here whereby the N sound becomes an M sound because it's next to another bilabial sound. This process is called assimilation, and it's a very, very common 
type of sound change um, in English, but also in all languages. Just to give you a general definition, assimilation is where a sound changes to become more like a nearby sound. So what was originally an alveolar sound turns into a bilabial sound when it's next door to another bilabial sound. Right? It becomes more like the following sound, it, This, in this case in terms of place of articulation. So it's a very common type of sound change. There are other kinds of sound changes. Sometimes the exact opposite happens where a sound becomes less like a nearby sound. That process is called dissimilation. Uh, we also have uh, things like metathesis where the order of sounds is changed or uh, maybe more straightforward cases like loss where a, a sound is dropped from a word or addition where a sound is added to a word. All of those are examples of sound changes. Let's take a different kind of example here. Here's some uh, sentences from um, early modern English. I'll just read them with modern pronunciation. All things be naked and open to his iron. Uh, there, iron is the plural of the word I, so you see through your iron in this case. Or in the second example, who waiteth for dead men shoeing uh, shall go long barefoot. So shoeing is the plural of shoe, right? Um, obviously, these two words have changed, and the plurals today are uh, end in s. Uh, so we instead of iron, we have eyes, and instead of shoeing, we have shoes. So the question is, how do we explain that change from the n consonant as a plural to the s consonant as a plural? Well, it's not doesn't have anything to do with the particular sounds, but rather it is designed to fit into a larger pattern, right? The vast majority of nouns in English take a plural with the S or related sounds. And uh, so these irregular forms with N as the plural have become regularized through a process that we call analogy. So analogy is the general term for this kind of change where you um, uh, ad adapt the form of a word to fit a structure to give you a more precise Definition, analogy is where the form of a word or a structure, sometimes a larger structure, is changed to fit the pattern of a similar word or structure, right? So regularization, taking what is an irregular plural, for example, and making it fit a regular pattern is an example of analogy. It's a different kind of example. Think about how you'd fill in this blank. So in, in traditional wedding ceremonies, there's a bride and a groom. Groom, of course, is the uh, term that we traditionally use there. Um, so groom, or think about where the word groom comes from. You might know uh, the somewhat longer form, more uh, formal term for a groom is bridegroom. So bridegroom gives us the shortened version groom. And bridegroom itself comes from an uh, earlier compound form. Uh, the bride, of course, uh, is a bride in earlier English spelled with a Y and pronounced breed. Um, so breed for bride. And then the second part of that, what became groom, was originally a an Old English word for man, uh, guma. So breed for bride and guma for man, breed guma, became bride groom. What I want to focus on here is how the uh, guma became groom, because if it had developed through normal sound changes, it would not be groom, it would be goom. So we should say, if we didn't change it, we should say bride goom, and then we would just simply today say the bride and the goom, but instead we say groom, and the question is why? Well, there's no uh, sound change reason here. Instead, it has to do with the form of the word. Uh, what happened is that the guma from Old English just sort of disappeared, but it was sort of fossilized in this compound word. It became a part of this compound word. And at some point, people were saying bride goom, and they might have asked themselves, wait, why do we say goom? I don't know. I know what a bride is, but I don't know what a goom is. And so they changed the form to fit with a more familiar word. They do know the word groom, right? A groom 
um, either the verb, like to groom uh, your hair or whatever, um, but more, maybe more likely here, the noun, the groom, is um, a person who takes care of the horses or is sort of a servant in that sense. Um, in any case, the point is that there was an existing word groom and there was not an existing word goom at this point, so they changed what they thought the form of the word should be from bride goom to bride groom. This process, a very interesting one, is called folk etymology. Folk etymology, um, to give you a more formal definition, is where a word or a phrase is restructured um, in order to fit into some kind of imagined history, imagined origin story in that sense. Right. So um, they, they figured bridegroom must come from a combination of the familiar words bride and groom, even though that groom has no connection to the more familiar word groom. Another um, well-known example of this is the case of the animal that we call a woodchuck. A woodchuck is a native North American species, um, so it was not originally part of the English language until English speakers came to this continent. And when they came to this continent, they found um, indigenous people who, of course, had a, a word for that animal. That word was something like ochik in the native Algonquin languages that English speakers first came into contact with. So they would say, what is that animal? And they'd say, ochik. Of course, ochik doesn't mean anything to an English speaker. Um, and so they decided, oh, it must be a woodchuck. They sort of came up with existing pieces, wood and chuck, which sound kind of like ochik. Um, uh, and it gives a kind of nice story. And then they made up a little song about how much wood could a woodchuck chuck, and, and it was all um, uh, fun going from there on out. But in any case, woodchuck has no etymological connection to either wood or chucking. Um, it's just uh, a kind of story that was superimposed on the history of this particular word. That's what folk etymology is like. You might recall the examples we talked about earlier in the course uh, of what we called egg corns, uh, words like uh, a, a shoe in or just desserts. Those are also examples of this phenomenon of folk etymology just by a different term. Let's think about word meaning and semantics here. Here's an example. Um, the verb arrive um, can have a large number of meanings. You can arrive uh, by car, you could arrive by foot, you could arrive by bike, you could arrive by skateboard, you could arrive by boat if it were a situation like that. Lots of different kinds of arriving, arriving by different modes of transport. Originally though, the verb arrive comes from French, as some of you will recognize, arriver, um, and then originally from Latin, arripare, so the ad in arripare means to or toward, a common prefix. And the key there, the center, uh, the root there is ripa for shore. So originally this word meant to come ashore. In other words, to arrive by boat or by water. Um, and so um, in its original sense, it had one particular kind of arriving, one particular mode of arriving. And now, of course, it has um, been extended so that you can arrive by lots of different forms. This uh, process is one that we call generalization. So generalization is a semantic change process. It's a kind of semantic change where the scope of a word, uh, its meaning has been extended or broadened, right? So it went from meaning arriving from one particular mode to arriving in general. Other types of semantic change include the opposite of that, specialization, where it goes from a more general meaning to a more narrow meaning. There's also a process called pejoration, which is uh, where a word takes on a negative meaning. And the opposite of that, amelioration, uh, or amelioration, where a word takes on a positive meaning, right? Positive connotations are ac acquired. Or there's all sorts of other kinds of changes, lots of metaphorical shifts uh, where a word gets used in a new uh, meaning. If you talk about the foot of a mountain, for example, that's a kind of semantic change based on the metaphor of uh, mountains with bodies that have feet and so forth. So lots of semantic changes, a uh, very common process. Well, we've really just scratched the surface when it comes to the many ways that languages change. 
you can of course find um, descriptions and other examples um, in the readings for class. As we explore how English has evolved over time, it's good to have these, these patterns in mind as a way of understanding some of the mechanisms that underlie the changes that we'll be observing.